Let's bow our heads in prayer. Lord Jesus, we thank you for providing a salvation that does not rely on our virtue or our accomplishments. Amen. Your brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus, the greatest responsibility that God gives to parents is that of passing on the faith in Christ to their children. It's one of the reasons that we hear during the sacrament of baptism the question addressed to the parents where the parents promised to raise that child in the, in the training and instruction of the Lord. That's something that scripture also requires and instills with parents. The Apostle Paul says that in, in the book of Ephesians. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Bring them up in the training and the instructions of the Lord. That command is not only for dads, it's for moms as well. It's the number one calling that mom and dad have. We see it in baptism as well. There's many that look at that sacrament of baptism and look at it and they say it's just a ritual. They'll say it's a sin when Christians say that baptism saves. They'll say that many Christians look at the sacrament of baptism and say once, ba once baptized, once saved, always saved. And that's not how Lutherans or the Bible look at it. You see, baptism is nothing about the Word. Baptism receives its power through that powerful Word of God, that same powerful Word which God used to create this universe. Jesus tells us to go into all the world, and he tells us to make disciples of all nations, all people, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything he's commanded us. Baptism and teaching can never be separated, and that's something that parents need to be mindful of as we look at the spiritual upbringing of our children. So we look in our lesson for this morning, might not be the most familiar to many of you. It's a story about one of the patriarchs, one of the great people of faith mentioned in the Old Testament. Isaac was the son of Abraham and his wife, Rebekah. God had blessed these two people with sons, twins, twins by the name of Esau and Jacob. While Rebekah was pregnant with these two twins, we're told through Moses in the book of Genesis that there was almost a war going on inside of her. These two were struggling. It was something that was troubling her. And so she inquired of the Lord what was going on, and the Lord told her that these two were struggling. And then he told her this. He said, what this means is that the younger is going to be served by the older. It was something that was strange, something that was foreign, because the firstborn, the first one that was born, was always the one who received the lion's share of the inheritance, and there was also the one who was going to receive the birthright. The one through whom the promised Savior of the world was going to come. The seed, the offspring of the woman, the offspring of Eve who would come and crush the head of the devil. But God here had told, told Rebecca that the opposite was going to happen here. This blessing would go to the younger. That was something that she had shared with her husband. That was something that she shared with her sons. This was God's will. This was God's plan. But while Sarah knew this, <coughs> while she shared it with her husband, while that message was shared with the boys, it was a message that didn't sink in with any of them, sad to say Esau, who was the firstborn, he was not a godly man. He did not appreciate the faith and the beliefs of his father. 
He had no regard for that birthright that should have normally been his. When he got married, he didn't take believing women for spouses. Well, first of all, he didn't follow God's plan for marriage. took more than one wife. Neither one of them were believers. He was not a man of faith and definitely did not have a regard for that birthright or God's plan of salvation. <clears throat> Despised it. You could say there, he was apathetic towards the faith. Jacob was different. He had heard what the Lord had told his mother. He had heard those words. And he looked upon that as something that's important. But he felt that he had to take things into his own hands. And so one time while his brother was out hunting and out in the fields and he came back, and anyway, he was making some lentil stew. And Esau came back, he was famished, he was tired, and he said, I'll give you anything for some of that stew. And Jacob said, well, sell me your birthright. And Esau said, what do I care about that? He says, I'm tired, I'm about ready to die. Not a problem. And that shows you more of Esau's apathy, but then Jacob thinking that he could take matters into his own hands and not trust God that God was going to do what he had promised. Let's stop back and take a look at Esau's apathy, apathy towards the faith. Where did he get that from? Now, I'm not trying to blame Isaac or Rebekah they were both God-fearing people. Esau was apathetic towards his blessing. And what I want us to see this morning is I want us to see ourselves in all of the characters that are in the text of God's Word this morning. Because we can see ourselves in each and every one of them. When it comes to apathy, maybe we don't all put ourselves in the feet of, of Esau here. But yet, each and every one of us can wear his sandals. And I think we can relate. Okay? Esau was apathetic to God's promises, to his will, to his blessings. And today I often see that when it comes to how we raise our children or think that we're raising our children in the faith and in God's promises. Okay. Now, don't get me wrong here. We're all responsible, and we're all going to have to stand before God someday and give an account for our life of faith. None of us are going to be able to point the finger at somebody else and say, Lord, because mom and dad did this, or my brothers and sisters did this, that that excuses me from the choices I made. But yet, how we raise our children can often lead to apathy. Now, also, too, a God-fearing parent who does most of the things right, there are many God-fearing parents who have been grieved because their children have gone the opposite way, despite what God says in his word, train up a child in the way he should go, and in the end he will not depart from it. But I look at some things today that just breed apathy in how we raise our children spiritually. We get them baptized, we bring them to the font, and then after that, sometimes worship is very sporadic. Sunday school? Ah, uh, uh, really don't have time for that. We make sure to get them to confirmation class, but, you know, what's the spiritual life and training and sharing of Jesus in the home? And we think that we are instilling in our children the truths of God's Word. And then we're surprised that as the years go on, that our children grow up being apathetic to the church, to worship, and to the Lord. I've had conversations with parents that have said to me, parents my age and parents that are older say, Pastor, you know what? I'm reaping what I sowed. What do you mean? Well, you know what? When I was raising my children, I didn't raise them to make difficult choices. 
didn't get him to church, didn't get him to Sunday school. And now, after I've grown up and seen the mistakes I've made, my children are making the same mistakes. As I've talked to parents today, because usually one of the things that I see where the ball is dropped in this area is when it comes to school. There's a sports activity, there's a school activity, and that's never a question of where that child's going to be. But if there's a church activity going on at the same time, 99 times out of 100, the school's going to win out. And I talk to parents about that, and they say, parents, and then they say, pastor, you know what, that's not fair. You're expecting me, you're expecting the children to make choices that they shouldn't have to make yet. Because that's soul. Life isn't easy. Life is always a matter of choices, and those choices aren't always easy. I'm thankful that as I was raised, and don't get me wrong, I love athletics. I love the activities that go on at school. They're wonderful blessings. When I was a kid, my dad said to me, if there was a conflict, if there was something going on at school or at church, my dad said to me, the Lord's always going to come first. I remember coming down on Sunday mornings with my baseball gear on and carrying my duffel bag and my dad saying, where do you think you're going? I'm going to play ball. There's church tomorrow night too, son. You better be there. Didn't appreciate it at the time, but those were lessons that dad instilled me in me, helping me to understand that there's always choices. And there are good ones, not necessarily easy ones, that are to be made. Those are how the faith, that's, those are instances where my parents instilled the faith in me as I was growing up. And I'm grateful for that. Don't get me wrong. The sin of apathy tempts me and often afflicts me as well. That's where I and you, we need to go back to the feet of the Savior, begging for forgiveness, being washed from our sin in his blood, and then we go out and we do better. Another one that we can probably put our, we can fit in the shoes or the sandals of in as well, is Jacob and his mother. God had spoken clearly to Rebecca on what his plan was to carry out this blessing to, to Jacob. It was going to be done differently, but it was going to be done nonetheless. Isaac didn't really want to believe that because Esau was his favorite, the oldest. And I've seen favoritism in families with parents among children and none of us are immune from it as well. It can be thing, something that's so damaging. Favoritism got in, in, in blind Esau, or Isaac, so to speak. Rebecca had her favorite in Jacob. And so, while she had God on her side, she still didn't trust to see that he was going to, to carry this out anyway. So she felt that she had to deceive her husband and encourage her son Jacob to deceive her husband as well in order to receive this blessing. And so she encouraged Jacob to disguise himself as Esau, to go out and get some goats from the flock, and she would prepare them for him so that they would tape, she would, he would think that, that was, he was eating wild game. She dressed him in, in, her, in his brother's clothes and clothed him, clothed him with skin so he would appear to be hairy. All of the deceit. The only thing that Jacob was worried about was that he was going to get caught. What I'm saying here is in the deceit is how often we think we're in the driver's seat. This is one that I'm very, very guilty of, and I think you can relate as well. You might be familiar with that country western song, Jesus Take the Wheel, and how often are we really willing to to let him drive and how dumb we are to think that we're actually in control. 
We think that there's things that we can do that, uh, or that we might have a better idea than the way that God's mapped out. It can fall into so many areas. Lord, Lord, I know what you say in your word, and I know what you say about your gift of, of, of sex between husbands and wife, but you know what, Lord, my situation's a little bit different. I'm going to take things just a, my way here, and, it's, and, 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 and I know better, and then we're surprised when that doesn't work out, and we find nothing but misery and sorrow. Or maybe we think of, of how God says that, uh, that he, we, how he will guide us and, and never leave us or forsake us. And, and we're looking for, for answers in, in how we should raise our families or, or work at our jobs or whatever it is. And we know what God has to say about how we should conduct ourselves. But you know what? Our situation is always different. We try to do it in a different way. There's times where, in my life, where I know that I want to be someplace, I'll pray about it, and I'll take things into my own hands to try to, 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 to plan for it. And there's nothing wrong with planning ahead. But I can't tell you how many times in my life where the Lord has stopped me short and said, no, this time it's not going to be that way. Or there's been many times where I'll say, okay, it's not going to be this is going to happen, but it's not under your terms. It's going to be under mine. And God's ways are always better than I can ask or imagine. I'm not in control. God is. When God tells me something in his word, something that he's going to do when he gives me his promises, his ways are better than mine. And in faith, I need to humbly kneel before him and say, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Again, that's humbling ourselves as we confess our sins, make use of our baptism, make the use of our baptisms, revel in God's forgiveness. And then we have to remember something too. Despite our idiocy, despite our sins, despite our arrogance, the blessing remains. There are a lot of negative things that happened with Isaac's family. Although Isaac, despite his obstinacy, he could see God's hand and humbly accepted God's will after all this happened. Jacob and Esau, Esau wanted to kill his brother and was going to do it, so Jacob had to flee. <coughs> And he was gone for 20 years until things settled down and then came back and his brother forgave him. But here's the thing. The blessing remained. What God said he was going to do happened despite all of this organizing and switching around and connivory and, and everything else. God's plan, plan still happened. Jacob was the heir who received the inheritance. It was through Jacob's blood that the Savior was going to come thousands of years later. It was the Savior, that offspring of a woman to whom this whole family clung for this whole period of time. Despite the sin, and it's not an excuse to go off and do what we want, what a wonderful reminder and what a wonderful blessing that God is always in control. And this is something that it, it, it goes over and over again. We even look in, in the life of Christ. From a human standpoint, we look at his ministry and his sufferings and death, and it looks like a disaster. <coughs> it looks like a complete loss, a complete failure, that God is not in control, but God was in control every single step of the way. And while all those things that were done to our Savior were unjust, were unfair, all of those things worked our salvation. His blood was shed, sin was paid for, he conquered death, Satan was defeated. And because of that, we are assured of eternal life through faith in Christ Jesus our Lord. What a blessing it is. Which brings us back once again to the awesome responsibility 
that we have as Christians, as we have as Christian parents, and that we have as Christian grandparents. And that's passing on that faith to our children. None of us are perfect. None of us here can say that we've made, never made a mistake. But as we cling to our Savior, as we're washed clean in His blood, as we grow in His Word, God gives us the strength to always keep Him in the center where He needs to be. And when Jesus is the center of my faith, when Jesus is the center of my life, everything else is going to fall into place as well. Rest assured, that's going to happen. May God give us the strength, the zeal, the energy, and the desire to put him first and to pass that faith on to our children that they might remain as well as us in our baptismal <clears throat> grace. The peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We'll continue singing the created music.